Greetings and welcome to week one of Business Ethics. This week we'll focus on describing the foundation of ethical theory, explaining theological, deontological frameworks and mixed frameworks, describe the Global Business Standards Codex, describe the history of business ethics, identify specific behaviors of high integrity, use ethical decisions to build character, explain how individuals rationalize unethical behaviors, and to determine between internal and external ethical issues. So, first question we want to ask is, uh, what's ethics? Well, these are values that individuals use to interpret whether or not any particular action or behavior that they do is considered acceptable or appropriate. How do you do this, you might ask? Well, first thing we want to do is we want to ask ourselves some questions. We want to know if the behavior or action is consistent with the overall duties and behaviors of the individual in question. Does the behavior or action acknowledge and respect the underlying rights of all individuals who will be impacted by the action? Would the behavior or action be considered the best practice in that specific set of circumstances? And lastly, does the behavior or action match the overall entrenched beliefs that you as the individual have? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about ethics in business. This week you were to read chapter one and chapter two. Uh, hopefully you've done that by the time you get to this uh, uh, discussion that we're having. Uh, okay, business ethics. These are a collection of values of a business organization that can be used to evaluate whether the behavior of the collective members that collective members of the organization are considered acceptable and appropriate. Uh, we can initially classify these based on these uh, perspectives. Descriptive ethics. Analytical ethics. And normative ethics. Okay, first let's look at uh, descriptive ethics. Uh, descriptive ethics are the presentation of facts related to the specific ethical actions of an individual or organization. Uh, they're used when uh, an observer wants to understand the course of events that generated the ethical issue. And also there's no interpretation of the facts or assumptions concerning why that course of action took place. Analytically speaking, when we look at the analytical ethics, it's understanding the reasons that any course of action that we might uh, do uh, may have an ethical impact. Also, we can call this uh, meta-ethics. Uh, it moves from how and when. So it's asking the question of how did this happen? And when did this happen? Which is the basis of the descriptive ethics viewpoint to asking why. Uh, hypotheses can be developed to uh, help understand the relationships among different variables which are impact ethical behavior, uh, address the motive behind actions instead of just being satisfied with a description of the actions. Then of course we have normative ethics. Normative ethics 
are a prescribed course of action that attempts to ensure that ethical behavior will be followed in the future. It moves the uh, evaluation of ethical behavior from the past to the present tense. Uh, it presents information on what should be done in the future rather than what was done in the past. Both part of descriptive and uh, analytical ethics. So you notice how all of these things are coming together a little. Uh, it allows employees and managers to address any potential ethical issues that uh, uh, before actually, before they occur. And it also uh, uses ethical tools like codes, ethical codes, which help direct normative ethical behavior by presenting what are acceptable and unacceptable types of behavior tolerated within the firm uh, that you're working. And by firm, we need the mean the business uh, that you're working in. We also have the theological framework. Uh, this focuses on the results of the conduct of the individual. And we do that through looking at ethical egotism, which is focusing on each individual's self-interest. Uh, this is based on the uh, belief that every individual should act in a way to promote himself or herself. If the net result will generate on balance positive rather than negative results. Then we look at utilitarianism which is based on the principle of utility. Each person's actions add to the overall utility of the community impacted by those actions and focus on the net result of their actions instead of the means or motives that uh, generated the reason for their actions. So we want to know the net result rather than uh, just what led us to it. Um, let's look at uh, Sigwig's dualism now. Okay, this attempts to bridge the gap between two competing ethical frameworks. Uh, of ethical egoism and utilitarianism. So, the core of the argument was that both theories had elements of cost-benefit analysis to help analyze the actions of the individuals. Uh, and Adam Smith presented an argument that uh, could support Sigwig's dualism, excuse me, dualism, uh, and it argues that uh, the greatest good for the greatest number is achieved by individuals pursuing their self-interest in the marketplace. The uh, den uh, dentological framework focuses on the duty or obligation in determining whether the actions were right or wrong, such as existentialism. This is based on the underlying belief that the only person who can determine right and wrong is the person making the decisions. And that each individual determines his or her own actions and is ultimately responsible for the consequences of those actions. So in other words, if you do the deed, you pay for it. Uh, Contractarianism. This is the social contract theory and it's based on uh, belief that all individuals agree to social contracts to be members within a society. In other words, if we're going to be a part of it, we agree to do everything that uh, uh, we're supposed to do within that society. Kant uh, has uh, an ethical view. Kant says that ethical decisions are based on the free will of the individual and the free will to make decisions that were considered rational needed to be converted into universal 
will. So the free will to make a decision that's considered rational is needed to be converted into a universal will. In other words, we all follow it. Mixed framework. Uh, this gives us uh, seven guiding principles that are considered part of the prima facie uh, obligation an individual has to society, such as fidelity. Fidelity means that the individual needs to keep explicit and implicit promises. So uh, whether they are implied or you s say, I promise, you have to keep that. You can't break it. Reparation is another one. This is where an individual has to act on repairing the consequences for any previous wrong, uh, any previous wrongful act. Uh, so you, you make reparation or you pay back or whatever it is that you must do to right that wrong. Also, there's gratitude. This is where an individual uh, has to be able to show gratitude for the kindness that others have given him or her. Um, then we have justice. This is where you should try to see that any goods are fairly distributed. In other words, uh, if we have 10 apples, or excuse me, five apples, and there are uh, six people, we have to make sure that each one of those gets the same amount of apple. Uh, beneficence. This is where an individual has uh, to focus on trying to improve the lives of others, not just ourselves, but the lives of others. And then we work on self-improvement. This is where we try to improve ourselves by focusing on virtue and intelligence. And then there's also non-injury. This is where you should cause no harm to others. Absolutely no harm. That's kind of like what the doctor has to do. He, his oath is to cause no harm. That's the one thing that they focus on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's talk about the Global Business Standards Codex. This is a codex that captures the eight major underlying principles in which ethical behavior can be interpreted and evaluated. These are uh, fiduciary, property, uh, reliability, transparency, dignity, fairness, citizenship, and responsiveness. Excuse me. First, let's talk about the fiduciary principle. Each officer has a legal fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the stakeholders and other employees within the uh, company. An implied fiduciary duty for every employee to act in a way that generates positive benefits for the perm. For example, conflicts of interest, uh, good faith efforts for carrying out responsibilities, prudence with the company's resources, loyalty, just to name a few. Um, then we look at the property principle. This is based on the belief that every employee should respect property as well as the rights of the owners of that property. You're expected uh, to be an employee who uh, is a good steward to the resource that uh, you have access to, such as uh, examples of property principle again would be uh, on the reverse, the bad side would be theft misappropriation of funds, wasting resources, misappropriation of uh, intellectual property, which uh, you have to pay attention to as a student because 
any time that you're writing a paper or or using someone else's words or their idea you have to give them credit if not you are misappropriating uh, intellectual property you're stealing their thoughts and that could have extreme consequences uh, the reliability principle is based on a belief that the employee's responsibility to honor the commitments he or she has made to the firm. For example, uh, you don't breach a promise or a contract, you fulfill it. Uh, you ensure that all the suppliers and business partners are paid in a timely manner. Then we have the reliability principle which is based on the belief that every employee should conduct business in a truthful and open manner. Uh, it also assumes that the employee will not make decisions based on personal agenda. In other words, you can't be biased about anything. Uh, you don't make that decision to help you. You make that decision to help everyone within the company. Dignity principle. This is based on the belief that uh, each person or employee needs to respect the dignity of all individuals. It encourages the enhancement of human development not only within the company itself and the marketplace, but also in society uh, as a whole. An example would be ensuring that human rights of health, safety, and privacy are followed. Then we have the fairness principle, which is based on the belief that stakeholders who have a vested interest in the firm should be treated fairly. Stakeholders, I mean, as an employee, you're a stakeholder. So everybody has to be treated fairly. Uh, there should be a reciprocal fairness, a distributed fairness, uh, fair competition, and procedural fairness. Then we have the citizenship principle. This is based on the belief that every employee should act as a responsible citizen in the community within which they work. In other words, your workplace or your where you live or what have you. doesn't matter. Uh, it's expected that you respect the laws of the community. There again, community meaning your workplace um, criminal and competition and environmental corporal uh, social responsibilities you have to follow those responsiveness principle now so is based on the belief that employees have the responsibility to respond to the requests for information about operations from various stakeholders and is expected to react in a timely manner. When you're asked for the information, you give the information ASAP, as soon as you possibly can. And we've been talking about uh, some of the stuff that relates to uh, business ethics. So now let's look at the history of business ethics. Um, a short description of it would be uh, in, in the 1960s, corporations were constantly under attack because of unethical conduct. Corporations in the United States began creating programs for social responsibility. Social responsibility has four types of responsibility involved. You have the economic, legal, ethical, and philanthropic. Uh, responsibilities. According to McMahon, there appears to be a consensus that in some way business ethics simply did not exist before the 1970s. Business ethics textbooks like the one you're reading uh, will sometimes include a brief survey of history of the business ethics, kind of seemingly potted at best. Uh, but rarely do their accounts agree with each other. In fact, some report narratives 
which seem to have been little, uh, excuse me, have little to do with business at all. So uh, that's going to vary from from uh, reading to reading. Um, okay, how do we uh, become or achieve behaviors of high integrity? Become ethical. Well, a few things we could do is uh, possess humility. You know, just be humble. Be truthful. Not only in your statements, but also in your actions. Uh, fulfill your commitments. Never breach. Always come to fruition. Fulfill it. Uh, strive for fairness. Never be biased. Okay, now I'm going to give you six uh, keys to building character through ethical decisions. As we said, be trustworthy. Do what you say you'll do. Act with integrity. Be honest. Don't deceive. And keep your promises. Be respectful. Treat others better than they treat you. So in other words, you know, when... Um, uh, someone does something for you, be respectful and treat them better than how they've treated you. Uh, I, in my day, it was always a, a little saying that um, no matter what someone says to you, smile. So in, in doing that, if someone says something bad against you, that smile is treating them better than they're treating you. Um, be responsible. Do what you're supposed to do. Be fair. Play by all the rules. Um, show that you care. And do your share. Don't shirk any of your responsibilities. Do your share within the business. You know, some, some people try to rationalize unethical behavior. Um, you know, in other words, this is why I did this. This is why I felt I had to do this. Uh, and I'm sure we've all seen it in, in one way or another in the businesses we've worked for. But uh, uh, a good example of that would be a manager cutting corners and playing an accounting game when he's trying to raise the share prices which will satisfy the shareholders, which will increase his bonus. Others might say, well, you know, my boss wants me to produce results. And he doesn't want any excuses, no matter how hard it is to get what he wants. And some business execs might say, I do not have the time nor the resources to follow an ethical course of action. Sometimes, you know, eth when we deal in the ethical course of action, we have to uh, do things legally. We have to do things according to government regulations. We have to research those regulations uh, so that we know what to do. Um, you know, and many will be uh, unethical in their uh, business to keep their job when they're faced with pressure to reach these unattainable business goals. Uh, Many will be unethical, like I said, to keep their jobs. Um, of course, the top factor for maintaining ethical culture within, uh, excuse me, uh, within uh, the corporation was corporate leaders providing support, leading, uh, leading the people as they should, leadership by modeling ethical behaviors and consistent communication pertaining to ethics in all aspects of that business. And that's internal. When looking at the external, uh, top factors of the external current ethical issues, excuse me, uh, seem to be closely related to governmental regulation and legal uh, requirements. Uh, We've covered everything that we need to cover for this week. Um, 
I want you to make sure that uh, you complete all your work on time. Uh, check out uh, the from the instructor uh, section because this is that's obviously where this video will be and anything else that I can come up with I will put there for you. Um, do everything that you're supposed to do on time. Be ethical about your appearance online. Don't just sign on and let the uh, computer run. You're not doing anything and you won't be considered present. You have to actually do the work to uh, get your attendance and to get your grade. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I'll see you again next week. Have a good day guys.